At the heart of almost any work of fiction is the question of what the story's characters think and feel. There are many tools an author might use to communicate to her readers just what exactly those thoughts and feelings are. She might describe a facial expression or tone of voice. She might, just by describing her characters' actions, imply what's occurring in their minds. Maybe she'll even tell the readers directly what the characters are thinking and feeling. In the last century or so, though, authors have often chosen to take the reader directly into the character's minds, letting the reader listen in on the character's thoughts and feelings as those thoughts and feelings occur. When this happens in a book, it is called stream-of-consciousness narration, and while it carries some risk, often what a character thinks or feels might not be beautiful or even comprehensible, when done well, it offers a glimpse at the humanity of fictional characters that few other literary techniques can deliver. The term was first used by psychologist William James in 1890, and he describes it like this. Consciousness, then, does not appear to itself as chopped up in bits. It is nothing joined. It flows. A river or a stream are the metaphors by which it is most naturally described. In talking of it hereafter, let's call it the stream of thought, consciousness, or subjective life. Let's look at some examples to see exactly what this means in practice. One of the earliest and best-known practitioners of stream-of-consciousness narration was the modernist writer James Joyce, who lived from 1882 to 1941. One of the most famous examples of stream-of-consciousness narration occurs in the last chapter of his novel, Ulysses, in which Molly Bloom delivers a 4,391-word sentence, all of which is internal monologue. It ends like this. I was a flower of the mountain, yes, when I put the rose in my hair like the Andalusian girls used, or shall I wear a red, yes, and how he kissed me under the Moorish wall, and I thought well as well him as another, and then I asked him with my eyes to ask again, yes, and then he asked me, would I, yes, to say yes, my mountain flower, and first I put my arms around him, yes, and drew him down to me, so he could feel my breasts all perfume, yes, and his heart was going like mad, and yes, I said yes, I will, yes. You can see how the narrative attempts to jump around, foregoing standard syntax, in order to portray something closer to the thoughts that occur in our brains. Also, famously, Joyce uses no punctuation in this chapter, except for the final period, which is also the final period of the book. In this way, he is able to portray the stream that William James talked about, and while the excerpted passage may be difficult to understand at first, the effect of the internal thought process shines through. In a second example, we see the young hero of Joyce's novel, A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, wandering the streets of Dublin's red light district in a state of lusty confusion. The wasting fires of lust sprang up again. His blood was in revolt. He wandered up and down the dark, slimy streets, peering into the gloom of lanes and doorways, listening eagerly for any sound. He moaned to himself like some baffled, prowling beast. He wanted to sin with another of his kind, to force another being to sin with him, and to exult with her in sin. He felt some dark presence moving irresistibly upon him from the darkness, a presence subtle and murmurous as a flood filling him wholly with itself. Obviously, one can imagine another way of writing this. Joyce might simply have described the character walking down the street, or he might have offered some paraphrase of the character's thoughts, something like, he looked around for someone to sleep with. But by using stream of consciousness, he brings the reader into close proximity with the character's actual thoughts as they're occurring, and creates an intimate, perhaps even uncomfortably intimate, knowledge of that character's struggle. Another famous practitioner of stream-of-consciousness narration was the Nobel Prize-winning author William Faulkner, who lived from 1897 to 1962. This example is the opening passage from his novel The Sound and the Fury. From this example, we can see how stream-of-consciousness narration often can be confusing as well as intimate. Reading this passage, do you know immediately what's going on? Through the fence, between the curling flower spaces, I could see them hitting. They were coming toward where the flag was, and I went along the fence. They took the flag out, and they were hitting. Then they put the flag back, and they went to the table, and he hit, and the other hit. Then they went on. 
What the character is describing here is two people playing golf. While it certainly would have been clearer to just say that, the author uses stream of consciousness to draw us in to the character's mind. He is a character who, when he looks at golfers, doesn't see golfers necessarily. He sees two men hitting. The result is that we as readers are much closer to the character's perspective, even if we're a little confused. In character-driven fiction, an author's goal is to bring the reader close to her character's thoughts and feelings. While there are any number of methods for achieving this goal, one of the more modern techniques is the use of stream-of-consciousness narration, whereby the character's thoughts and feelings are laid before the reader directly, unfiltered, on the terms of that character's own mind and perspective. While this can be confusing, it also can bring the reader close enough to the story that he experiences the character's life as it happens.